As I've looked over the years at this subject of prayer and thought about it, it has struck me at times that when our prayers are answered, we almost seem surprised, as though that is kind of unusual. And yet, as we read the scriptures and look at the lives of those faithful ones of old, faithful men and women of God, and of course Jesus himself, we get the impression, at least I have in studying these things, that it's almost to be understood that prayer is expected to be answered. It's just part of the spiritual life, the Christian life, that prayer is answered and that God expects us to realize that and to experience that. And yet we find that prayer sometimes does not seem to be answered for one reason or another. And there are various reasons that the Bible gives. Today I'm talking about a certain set of hindrances, perhaps not all of them that might be thought of, but at least some of the major ones. Once there was a young, a young man who was a college student who found that he needed some funds, as college students sometimes do, and he called home to see if his dad would send him some extra funds to take care of his expenses. And they were talking on the telephone, and all of a sudden, the connection was broken. The lines were all there. The telephone was still in good working order, apparently. The operator was still on hand. But until the connection was restored, no communication was possible. I'd like to think of prayer in a sense like that. We do not see God face to face with our eyes, nor do we usually hear his voice in any audible way. And yet, we are speaking to him in prayer, and he hears our prayers, much as one who is on the other end of a phone. And yet, that conversation that we are trying to get through to him may, for one reason or another, be cut off or hindered so that the call does not get through. In our scripture lesson this morning, we notice that in Isaiah 59.1, the Lord is saying that his hand is not shortened. That is, it will reach to where it has to reach. And he says his ear is not heavy that he can't hear. God is not deaf. Sometimes you think he were the way that some people shout their prayers at him. But he's not deaf. He can hear even the whispered prayer of the mouth or even the unspoken prayer of the heart. He can hear that. And he knows that it's being uttered. But notice verse 2. He says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. That isn't that he cannot hear, but he will not. He was not willing to hear under those circumstances. The thing that we would like to look at this morning is those hindrances to prayer that we might think of as our sins, or those ways in which we offend or grieve God's heart so that he is unwilling to listen to our prayers and to hear our prayers. And I suppose at first when we think about those kinds of things, the first thing that might come to our mind is some great flagrant sin. Of course, that certainly does cause God to be unwilling. We have a, an example of that type of thing in 2 Samuel 11, very, very sad history that some of us were discussing last night. The history of David, the king, found here in 2 Samuel 11. David had, or was engaged at this particular time in a certain war. His armies were away at the front, fighting. 
David was in Jerusalem while his armies were fighting. One evening, David got up and went to walk on the roof of his palace. He looked out over the city and he could see a beautiful woman taking a bath, apparently on the roof of her house. David conceived a sudden lust for this woman named Bathsheba, and he sent his messengers, thank you, sent his messengers to get her and bring her to him. Probably most of you know the sad story of David's adultery with Bathsheba. He not only committed this sad thing, but he also saw to it that her husband, Uriah, died in battle. He so contrived things that Uriah would be isolated from the others in his unit, would be surrounded by the enemy soldiers, and would be killed, which would leave David a free hand. Because meanwhile, Bathsheba had conceived a child, and David was very embarrassed that Uriah should know this. So he saw to it that Uriah was killed. After this happened, of course, we are told in verse 27, that David sent and fetched Bathsheba to his house. She became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Obviously it did. It was a terrible thing that he did. Here was a man who was <clears throat> said to be a man, <clears throat> pardon me, after God's own heart. And yet this man who was very godly in many ways, in a moment of weakness and passion, abandoned his principles of righteousness and committed a terrible sin, several sins, in fact. Later on in the next chapter, we read that the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David to bring this before him by means of a parable, a very famous one. David suddenly realized that he was the one that Nathan was talking about. Famous words here in which he says, Thou art the man, David. You're the one because you have done this terrible thing. And David said in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. He confesses his sin. And Nathan said, The Lord has put away your sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, or however, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. This child was born unto David and Bathsheba in due time. We read that after he was born, that the Lord smote the child, and he was very ill. David lay, went and fasted and lay before the Lord in, on his face in prayer, pleading to God for this child, praying earnestly that this child should not die. But it says on the, in verse 18 in chapter 12, it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him about this. They thought if he's done this, what will he do when he finds out the child has died? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David 
comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Now, this is a very strange incident in some ways because we see the, the anger of God in this, in this incident, but we also see the grace of God. The anger of God in that David had committed such heinous sins, but also the grace of God in that upon his repentance he was forgiven, and yet the child died. And afterwards, by this same woman, a child was born who later was to become King Solomon, the child of David and Bathsheba, and the second child of them. And yet, while David prayed and fasted and cried out for this child, this first child, God's ears were closed to his prayer. There was no way that that prayer could be answered as David wished under the circumstances. And so we do see that flagrant sin of this kind, unrepented, unconfessed to God, does have its terrible consequences in keeping prayer from being answered. But let's look at another hindrance to prayer which is found in the scriptures. In the 66th Psalm, verse 18, if you would care to turn there. Psalm 66, verse 18. The psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now you'll notice he does not say that it has to be some great and terrible crime. This really was a crime, what David had done. But he says, even if it's some iniquity in my heart, something that I'm hiding there, maybe something nobody else knows about, he says that too can keep God from hearing our prayers. Secret sin, unconfessed sin. Probably one of the famous examples in Scripture of this type of thing is one that is found in the book of Joshua, in the seventh chapter of Joshua. You remember that God had told Joshua, that as he brought the people of Israel into the promised land, God would be with them. He would protect them. He would help them overcome the Canaanites, destroy their cities. This seventh chapter is immediately following the great victory over the city of Jericho, a huge city for those days, a walled city, which the Israelites could not capture except God caused the walls to fall, as you know. But after that, chapter 7 tells us about they're going to a smaller town called Ai. It was not a very large town. When they tried to capture Ai, there was no way. In fact, the people of Ai came out and we read in verse six, 5 that they smote 36 men of the Israelites, killed them apparently, and then chased the rest of them away. The people of Israel became very frightened. And it says the hearts of the people melted and became as water because these few people of Ai were able to conquer them or keep them from taking their city. What had happened? How come these thousands of Israelites could not take a little city like Ai after a huge city of Jericho had fallen? Well, because we read that a certain family there, family of Achan, had taken some things that were forbidden. They didn't confess this until they were confronted with what they had done. And Achan confesses in verse 21, what he had done. He says, and he's talking about what had happened in Jericho. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, 
of 50 shekels weight, I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Achan and his family, and his family knew about it, obviously. It was taken and put in their tent. It was hidden from all the rest of the people. They didn't know about it, but God knew about it. That sin kept them from victory. That sin kept God from helping them in their conquest. And it wasn't until this sin was eradicated and was as it was in the next chapter we read, or at the end of this chapter, that the people were able to go out and conquer Ai. It seems to me as we realize that the scriptures tell us that all of these things happened to Israel as examples for us, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, that we should see in this event of history something that can teach us a lesson. This hidden sin, this secret thing, was what kept God's ears closed to his people's prayers and his hand shortened from giving them the victory over the Canaanites. These kinds of things also must be taken care of in our lives if we would have our prayers answered. Jesus once said in the, para in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5 of Matthew, in verses 23 and 24, something quite closely related to this. He says, If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Apparently, the idea is, in its, of course, in the setting of the temple, the temple was still standing. Jesus is telling his disciples, if you come to the temple and you have a gift to present to the Lord, and usually that was done when someone came to pray to the Lord for some specific answer, he says, if you remember that there's something there between you and your brother, Perhaps only you and he know about it. You go and take care of that. You go and get reconciled, get this thing squared away, so to speak, with your brother. And then come and offer that prayer and that gift. Because that particular problem could be a hindrance to your prayer. That particular thing could keep your prayers from being answered. It's something, <clears throat> something we should, should think about, I believe. Because again, we often, it seems to me, wonder why prayer is not answered. We may say, well, maybe God just doesn't answer prayers sometimes. But he does if we are not hindering those answers in some way or another. In Proverbs, the 28th chapter and the 9th verse, we are given another hindrance to prayer. In verse 9, chapter 28 and verse 9 of the book of Proverbs. He says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Please notice that. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law. Now, in the Old Testament context, the law means the word of God, the scriptures. Turn away our ears from hearing the scriptures. Then he says, pardon me, his prayer shall be an abomination. Many times we find ourselves neglecting the word of God for one reason or another. We're not reading it. We're not taking time to meditate in the Word of God. We let our busy schedule and our material requirements and our material uh, interests 
keep us, for one reason or another, from spending time in the Word of God with the Lord, alone, before the Lord, or with our family, perhaps. And then we wonder why the Lord doesn't seem to have time to answer our prayers. I think we should think about that. Maybe if we show the Lord that we're interested enough and concerned enough about his word to spend time in the word, he will seem to have more interest in listening to what we have to say to him. Because after all, this book is God speaking to us, is it not? Even though we may not hear the audible voice, we do have the written word of God. And sometimes the still small voice in the heart in which God is speaking to us if we will only listen. And so we must think about this. If we turn away our ear and our eye from the word of God, then our prayer may have great difficulty in getting through to the Lord. In the first chapter of Proverbs, we have a very another uh, scripture that relates to this. In verses 23 through 30, Proverbs 1, 23 through 30. Here's what God is saying to the people. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Notice the, the, the appeal here. Turn to me at my reproof. If I reprove you, if I try to correct you, listen to it. And he says, if you do, I'll pour out my spirit on you. But then notice the opposite. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. God's saying, I, I, lit, I set out my hand or I stretched it out to you. Nobody paid any attention. But you have set it not, all my counsel and would, none of my reproof. You didn't want to accept it. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come up, cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. It's something we should think about now before those times of calamity come. He says, listen, regard, pay attention to my word, to my correction, to my reproof. Because every one of us, no matter how far we may have advanced in the Christian life, at times need correction, reproof, direction for our lives. And he says, if you will listen, then I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words to you. But the opposite is also true, sadly, if we don't listen. We have in Scripture the example of Israel, an age-long example which is still in existence today to a great extent. In the seventh chapter of Zechariah, beginning in verse 8, it's very interesting what he says to the people of Israel here. The word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Now, Zechariah here is only repeating what the prophets had said time after time to the people of Israel. Be kind to one another, he's saying. Don't oppress your fellow man. Don't be unkind to the widow and the fatherless. Be merciful to them. Don't try to exact every cent from them. Jeremiah had said the same thing to the people in his day. 
and they wouldn't listen to him either. And finally the Babylonians came. Verse 12 says, Yea, they made their heart, or no, verse 11, but they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulder. Notice how he puts that. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. When God said this to them, they wouldn't listen. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. Now Zechariah is referring to a well-known fact of history. Zechariah lived after the Babylonian exile, after the time that the, ba the Jews returned from that captivity and restored their society and their nation once more. So he is saying, remember what God did to your forefathers and let them be taken away among the nations, and some of them still were there in exile. Some had returned. Zechariah's family had returned. He seems to be saying, you'd better pay attention because if you do the same things your forefathers did, you too will be scattered. The tragedy is, that some of them did not listen and it got worse and worse so that by the time when our Lord came several centuries later he had to say to the generation then living behold your house is left unto you desolate you shall not see me henceforth until you shall say blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord and then he went on to say in Luke 21 that they would see their city besieged by the armies and that that city would fall. And he says, you shall be taken away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be a desolation trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles should be fulfilled. That has been Israel's age-long suffering the scattering among the nations, the, wander, the wandering vagabond Jew, a proverb among the nations until our own time. And still, though many have returned to the promised land, there are still many more among the nations. This, it seems to me, is a very powerful example and should be to us of what happens when people who profess to know and serve God turn away from him and will not listen to his word. There is, however, on the positive side of all this, a wonderful promise found in 1 Peter 3, verse 12. Let's look at that as we draw our thoughts to a close here. He says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Those who are determined that they will obey him, that they will follow him. And his ears are open to their prayers. He can hear their prayers, implies that he will answer their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Those who will not turn to him. In 1 John, the first chapter, we have a promise that many of us have claimed many times. And it's one we all need to claim because we all at times turn away from the Lord. In 1 John, the first chapter, in the ninth verse, and it seems to me it's a key to getting our prayers answered. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a solution to our sin problem, and it is to go to the Lord and confess our sins, whether they be flagrant ones like David's or secret ones like Achan's, whatever they may be. Or if that is simply the sin of disinterest and neglect of God's word and of prayer in general and the Christian's uh, life. Those things we can come before the Lord and he will hear that prayer if the confession is sincere, one that comes from the heart. Then he says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. And we can believe and trust God's promises. He will forgive us. And having forgiven us, he will answer our prayers. So these hindrances to prayer are things that we should look at from time to time. We should ask ourselves, is our prayer life altogether what we would want it to be? Or does it seem to be hindered? in some way. If it is, let's ask ourselves what those hindrances could be and deal with them before the Lord in confession, in restitution if necessary, and in cleansing because of his grace. The grace which even enabled him to give David and Bathsheba another son, King Solomon the great and wise king. So in the midst of God's anger and wrath is also his love and his grace. And we should not lose sight of either one of those things.